Greetings. Today is probably the final week in our series of trying to understand the things that Christians say. I'm contemplating doing a bonus one for the first Sunday in Advent, a Christmas-related one, but we'll see how that goes. But the phrase for today is, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. In our psalm for today, Psalm 119, we read these exquisite words, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. I will study your commandments, reflect on your ways, delight in your decrees and not forget your word. That's a very, very particular way of reading scripture. So as in most instances in the series where we have observed these things that people say, this phrase, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Uh, I think the people who use it uh, mean well. I think it's an attempt on their part to honor the inspiration and the authority of the Bible. It's a way of saying, perhaps in a secular world, this is where I stand. But I want to dare to say today that it's actually a careless thing to say because the Bible just isn't that kind of a book. Instead it is, as the psalmist describes it. It's a book not just to read, it's a book to be studied. And it's a book not just to be studied in some academic sense, it's a book to be reflected upon, to be understood. And not just to be reflected upon, but also to be delighted in. It's a very particular kind of thing to delight in writing and in the word and in the presence of this word and to delight in it so deeply that at the end of the day we are able to not forget we are able to recall the scriptures well they live with inside of us that's a very particular way of engaging scripture the renowned theologian Jürgen Moltmann said that when people speak to him about the Bible he says first I would ask them if they had read the Bible then I would ask if they had understood it. I really have loved that phrase for a long time. I would ask if they had read the Bible, and then I would ask if they had understood it, which I think is just another way of Multman using the psalm, psalmist's idea of, I will study your commandments. Uh, have I read it? I will study your commandments, and I will reflect on your ways. Have I understood it? Now, like the rest of the world, the church is flooded with memes and popular cliches. Even before uh, the, the modern digital age, people still had little catchy sayings around the place. And sometimes I think people say things, Christians say things, or defend their religious convictions, not from having read the Bible necessarily, but rather from picking up a catchy line or seeing something on social media or hearing someone say something and being drawn to it. And for me, the whole point of this series really has been that at the very least, I think that we are called to be thoughtful followers of Jesus. Not simply followers of Jesus, but thoughtful followers of Jesus. As our psalm again reminds us, I will study your commandment and reflect on your ways. I will study and reflect thoughtful followers of Jesus. And this is essential because not every common or popular saying, even if it sounds good, that's the point of the series, even if it sounds good, not everyone is good or trustworthy. So I'm going to use two today just to make my point. The first is, we are fond of saying in the Christian community, God will never give us more than we can handle. I hear that a lot as a pastor. And the thing is, it's almost right, but it's not what the Bible actually says. And the bit that's not right is critical. I don't want to sound like an angry school teacher, but if someone says God will never give us more than we can handle, my question is a bit like Multmans who go, have you actually read the Bible? Have you read what the Apostle Paul wrote? Because you'll find that that is not what the Scriptures say. Let me share it with you just briefly. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And then this is the part where people get stuck. No temptation has overtaken you. So it's that word that sometimes is translated as tested, but actually means temptation. So Paul writes, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humankind. And God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. In other words, 
Paul is saying that none of us really has an excuse to fall into temptation because we will never be tempted beyond what we can bear. This is not a passage on the sufferings of life. It's a passage on the temptations of life. It's the promise that God will always give us a way out of whatever temptations we face. Now, this is very important that we get this right, that we understand it correctly, because if we believe that God will never give us more than we can handle, it means that we, again, as we've observed in weeks past, it means that we believe that God somehow is the source of our suffering. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is not that God will never give us more than we can handle. Too many of us have testimonies about how we have been pushed well beyond our limits. Instead, the gospel is the promise that in whatever life throws at us, and however we respond to the sufferings of life, we can depend upon the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the faithfulness and the strength of God, which are always available to us on Christ, the solid rock I stand. Multman's word first, I would ask if they'd read the Bible, and then I would ask if they'd understood it. There's another one, it's the same thing with the famous phrase, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, the Barner Research Group did a survey in America, obviously, and quite remarkably found that 80% of Americans think that that phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is a Bible verse. And some people thought that it was actually one of the Ten Commandments, which is in its own way is interesting. doesn't sound a lot like a commandment, but anyway, some people thought it was a commandment. And it brings you back to Multman's words, or in the words of the psalmist, if you like. First, I would ask if they'd actually read the Bible, and then I would ask if they had understood it. The phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is not in the Bible, as we said, but it has enough truth in it. it. It rings as if it might be, as we saw in the American research, it rings as if it has enough truth in it, and that little bit of truth can actually be dangerous to us. So let's establish that, at least on the one hand, it is true that faith without works is dead. There is something about us doing something with God. To be a person of faith means that we are committed to a life of discipline, which is work and to a life of service, which too is work. Our faith is expressed through our actions. So there is no doubt that in God's love for us, God co-opts us to work in partnership with him, both for our own transformation, transformation as well as for the transformation of the world. That's absolutely clear, that there is God working with us. We both, we help in the work. But that's not the reason why that phrase gets used and bandied about in the Christian community. That phrase is most often used for at least one of two reasons, I think. Firstly, it's used sometimes to avoid having to help people in need. It's a way to justify our unwillingness to help people in need. It is true that on the whole, a healthy, well-functioning person is expected to be able to look after themselves in most aspects of life. But the reality is that our world is filled with people who, for a variety of reasons, cannot help themselves. Children and the extremely frail are good examples. But there are other examples too. For the reasonably well-off person, access to medical care, high-quality education, banking, even government services, the internet, email, job opportunities and so on, is far, far, far greater than it is for the poor. It's a, it's a cruel circle in which uh, the poor are caught. And so it's easy when we're sitting pretty with all those things available to us in ways that much of our nation and much of the world, quite frankly, doesn't have access to. It's easy for us to sit in our ivory towers and say, God helps those who help themselves. I do want to acknowledge that, of course, there are those who refuse to help themselves, who ignore the opportunities to be better or ignore the opportunities that others really work to open for them. And we know that that's true. But I think it's untrue and unkind to just generalize and say God helps those who help themselves, because it isn't generally true. We mostly don't know or understand the troubles that other people endure. Instead of God helps those who help themselves, this is what the gospel teaches. Uh, just a bit of context, when the Apostle Paul suffered what was probably some physical ailment, he describes it as a thorn in the flesh, he asks God to heal him, to take this thorn away. And this is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, three times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace 
is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, says Paul, and in the insults and hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the deepest truth of the gospel is not that God helps those who help themselves. The deepest and best truth of the gospel is that God's power works best in and through our weaknesses. When we are at our most vulnerable, there's a real sense in which our lives are most open to God's extraordinary work in us and through us. Multman says, first I would ask if they had read the Bible, and then I would ask if they had understood it. Won't you pray with me as we close today? Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for these holy writings through which you make yourself known to us in the most extraordinary way. Won't you help us to know them, to learn to love them, and to understand them, so that we can depend on you when trouble comes, and that your power can be at work in us even when we are weak, that we will be able to stand on solid ground because we have read and understood your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.